Well, welcome back, everybody, um, from our first break. Um, our next talk, of, our second talk of the day, is from Warner Losh, who's going to be talking about his adventures um, working with the Linux boot mm -hmm. kind of uh, interface for booting on systems. So I'm going to hand it over to Warner. Okay, so you can hear me okay, right? Okay, we have sound. You can hear me okay, right? Yes, we hear you, Warner. Yes. Don't have audio if you're trying to talk, Warner. No, I can okay. hear. Great. So let me share my screen. And no, not that one. And go into presenting mode. There we go. Hey, everybody. I'm Warner Wash. Today I'll be talking about my adventures in bootloading, um, specifically in getting FreeBSD's bootloader to work with Linux boot. I'll talk a little bit about all of these things. You've got to understand all the parts and maybe a tiny bit of my frustration when I get to the uh, lessons learned part of this um, talk. Anyway, what is Linux boot? Um, Linux boot is a way that um, has become more popular for booting systems. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and I'll also talk about FreeBSD's boot process. We have kind of a funky little boot process that not everybody has. So uh, it's useful to have somewhere and it helps you understand what's going on. So I'll talk about it here. And then I'll talk about the things I needed to do to FreeBSD's bootloader to get it working um, as a Linux binary. And uh, finally, I'll talk a little bit about technical debt in the bootloader, meaning these are the things that were a pain that uh, I had to uh, work around. So anyway, what is Linux boot? Well, it's this generic term for booting Linux first and then loading the operating system after that. Um, it's designed to uh, have some kind of low-level init code uh, and then jump to a stripped down version of the Linux kernel. This low level boot code is uh, oftentimes uh, just available in binary format, which is why you have these two parts. Um, it's the result of a number of years where people have tried to basically boot their computer with Linux, starting with Linux BIOS, core boot, and a bunch of other things. Um, and it was really born out of frustration with the current bootloading processes. Booting is too slow if you UEFI. There's a large attack surface. You can't really um, understand what uh, you've booted. In addition, different vendors wanted to uh, have a quicker path to market. And they figured if they want one loader, one driver for Linux, they don't have to write a driver for Linux and then also a driver for UEFI and core boot to get their systems up and running. Um, and it has a number of very mature uh, tools around it. Um, there, there's a number of good scripts to build the Linux boot image um, and also the initRD that goes along with that. The initRD, for those of you that don't know Linux, is basically the first root that a system has. And it, uh, RD stands for um, initial root um, disk. Uh, and it's a RAM disk. And all of this combined together fits into uh, the NOR or the NAND that you have on the, on the board. Um, this isn't so popular in x86, although it exists there. It's more popular for uh, ARM and RISC-V and, and other embedded uh, deployments. And that you know, leads me to, well, why would we want to do this? Um, well, um, like I said, it's common in embedded uh, environments, including one that um, uh, the company I work for would like to deploy into. Um, and so that's the reason I'm actually working on this. We're doing a deployment um, for ARM64 there. Um, but another reason is uh, we found that doing scripting in UEFI was really, really hard. Doing it in the shell.efi um, was really hard for us to get the level of resilience we needed. So we thought that moving it to having a shell scripting environment would be easier to develop for, easier to test for, and also easier to deploy and give us a more robust uh, model. Um, in addition, like I said, it's growing in popularity in the Linux world. It's been around for about five years in its current form. Uh, and uh, we'll need it to uh, deploy into a number of different environments. One of the 
side benefits is if you've got a cloud provider that's Linux only, you can boot to Linux and then use this to boot FreeBSD after you booted your Linux kernel in their hypervisor. Um, and we looked at other alternatives. One of the ideas that was presented early on was, hey, why don't you hack Linux so that it can exec EFI binaries? And I could do a whole talk on that, but basically that, the, the little, that wasn't a very flexible approach. And while there is a uh, uh, proof of concept of this, um, it's been abandoned and is largely um, not going on. Um, so, um, so there was a question about how passing um, file systems to the next level of the kernel, and I'll and I'll get to that um, when I'm talking about the 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 rest of this. So I'll I'll answer that in a in a those, see the questions coming in. Um, so Linux boot is both a project and a concept. So the, the Linux project has, um, you know, has this, this is, I took this diagram from their website and basically it shows, you take one of the popular bootloaders say, and you take the low level init code, which for UEFI is PEI and core boot is the ROM stage, you boot SPL, and there's a number of other ones. Um, you have it do its thing and then you jump to a copy of Linux that's already in, the, in memory that's initialized and it will come up and boot like Linux does. It'll um, uh, enumerate the devices, set up the network stack, set up the storage stack and all of that. And as part of that, in the init RAM FS or the init RD, um, there will be a program that eventually calls um, a system call called kexec load or kexec file. Both of these do the same thing. They take um, data from a, a file and, and you tell the kernel where it will wind up uh, in physical memory. Uh, it's a fairly simple interface um, that presents some problems. And then once you're ready, once you have everything set, you call reboot uh, with um, a parameter that says, uh, don't reboot completely, just jump to that kernel that I just loaded. Um, and so once you've um, uh, you know, gotten into Linux and it runs its init script um, and the the, the the init script actually can do a number of different things. It will load, typically load the mandatory Linux file system. It will load different device drivers, potentially find a root that's over NFS or UA, uh, iSCSI or um, you know, load a RAID driver so you can boot off a kernel that's on this RAID system. Um, and it does all of that before calling the system calls I just talked about. And once you call the reboot K exec, the new kernel takes over. And this environment, um, it's basically a Linux, you know, running on a Linux distribution that's stripped down like a BusyBox or a U-Root instance. There's a number of other alternatives that um, time doesn't permit me to get into. It's a very rich field. Um, and so that lets you have a lot more flexibility. Most of the scripts, you know, run the initial things and do a couple of checks and maybe pop up a menu that says, do you really want to do this or you want to run this, this or that? Um, and then it uh, runs either the kexec tools or the uroot tools that does the kexec. Um, there's some interesting advantages to this. It's just a Linux binary, it's just a standard Linux binary. It runs in uh, a Linux system that, in fact, you could even run it in the FreeBSD emulator. I'll, I'll get to that when I'm talking about debugging uh, loader.kboot um, here in a few minutes. Um, generally, there's no swapping available, so you have to do everything in memory. So this limits the size of things you can load sometimes if you have a low memory footprint. Uh, and you don't always have the full rich environment that you do. Um, for example, the environment I'm deploying and doesn't have dev mem or some of the other things that might be security concerns uh, exposed to it. Um, so you, there are some problems we have to work around with that. Uh, but one thing you do have access to is all the raw devices. Um, and either you can mount file systems on that or your bootloader can look at the raw device. Um, and before I get into all the, the nuts and bolts of that, I wanna talk a little bit about how FreeBSD boots and kind of the model and ideas behind how FreeBSD you know, goes about doing its thing. Generally firmware starts, you know, the system resets, it jumps to a vector, firmware does its thing, does the low level init, and then loads the first stage of the FreeBSD boot process. Uh, 
a long time ago, this was, you got one sector on this disc and you better make the most of it because that's all I'm going to do for you. You got to do the rest. And so um, that's why we have boot one and boot two and um, it eventually loads boot loader. Now with UEFI and some other systems, you can uh, load the loader directly. Um, so you don't have all of that initial stuff uh, to worry about, but you know, FreeBSD says, okay, in that case, loader.efi, for example, um, it's the last stage of the boot and we'll just read the kernel in from there. Um, and bootloader sets up the environment the kernel expects is the short version, but basically we load all the loadable modules, we set all the environment, kernel environment variables, we do all the turn tunables, if there's firmware blobs or DTB blobs or any other auxiliary data, like on x86, we load memory maps in, in, with this mechanism. Uh, we do all of that and then um, we set the CPU up in the way that the kernel expects. And that varies from system to system. And what the kernel expects and what the bootloader gives is kind of a co-evolved system. And so we have to match it just right uh, for the kernel to work. Once we have all of those things set up, uh, the loader jumps to the kernel entry point and it does its thing. Um, does all the early initialization, probes devices, runs FCRC after mounting root and away you go. And I'm not gonna read all of these. This is a rather long list, but these are all the um, boot environments that we support. Everything from a very simple and basic x86 on MBR with BIOS, um, all the way up to hypervisors, which um, use a different kernel entry point. Um, so they can get around some of the bootstrapping um, trampoline issues that I'll be talking about later. Um, and you know some more legacy things like booting on a Mac or booting the old U-boot uh, ABI. Um, and so we, re we support these on a number of different systems, um, network booting, just booting, all this stuff. And so there's a, a very wide, a large range of systems you have to think about when you're working in the bootloader. Um, so for the services the bootloader provides, we provide Lua scripting. We also have fourth there for some legacy users. Um, well, the bootloader also has a framework for saying these are the disks and these are the partitions. Uh, here are the network devices you have that you might be able to talk to and boot off of. Um, there's different compression and cryptographic surfaces available, particularly for ZFS. Um, and there's a lot of file system supported. I've listed a few here. UFS and ZFS are probably the most important. Maybe that file system, if you need to grab something uh, when you're doing a UEFI boot um, so that you can, you know, load something before you know what your root is. Um, and, you know, there's a number of other fiddly bits that um, the uh, boot services provide that, uh, are more for user interface and not so much for the actual nut and symbols of booting. I'm not going to talk about those so much here because um, I didn't have to implement very many of them. Yeah. So I thought I'd, I'd get a picture. This is kind of an overview of the rest of my talk, um, at least until the part where I start complaining about what the, the uh, technical debt we have in the bootloader is. Um, and I decided to simplify just a little Um uh, we've got a, uh, um, we've got a, a the UFEI uh, init code that calls the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel has an um, initial RAM disk that it runs out of, runs its scripts. Eventually, it'll run loader.kboot. Um, and then loader.kboot looks at all the disks that are available uh, in the system and um, uh, figures out which one is, should be root. Um, usually some additional metadata is needed inside of the kroot, um, kboot environment to, to get that, but not always. It can, it can make a good guess. Once it's kexec to the kernel, it runs at the RC and you have a free BSD system running. Okay. So it turns out we have an existing loader.kboot and we have it because, um, Nathan uh, White wrote a driver for it as part of the PS3 boot uh, sequence. He wrote it when we had, were running FreeBSD on the PS3. Um, 
and the reason it's called K-Boot is a long time ago there uh, for the PS3, there was a project called K-Boot that uh, basically mimicked or we're mimicking what it did. And it, it basically loads a kernel and does a K exec. Um, and it used mostly old Linux interfaces. Linux's uh, K exec and pre-boot environment have evolved a lot over time. And so um, it used uh, some of the older interfaces that needed to be updated. Um, and there was limited configurability. It knew there was booting on a PS3 and um, anything that didn't need to boot on a PS3 wasn't provided. So uh, while it was quite good for booting there, it didn't have the breadth that you need to boot a general uh, OS. Um, and it only ran on PowerPC. So um, there's no allowances for, well, we have ARM and AMD64 and RISC-V and all this other stuff too. It was just you know very purpose-built. Um, and it didn't have really a good way to read files off of the host uh, file system. In this environment, you, there was nothing really of interest to read, but in my environment, it's actually very interesting to read off of that. Uh, finally, it could not run as a NIT. Um, something else had to start it and, and, and do all the initializations that a NIT does. Um, excuse me, do all the initializations that a NIT does and then um, run this program. So you couldn't have a, 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 an init RD that all, was, all it was was the FreeBSD bootloader and it would find everything else. So um, since I was just talking about init, that was one of the things I did. I wrote a mini init inside of the FreeBSD bootloader. So you can now run it as a Linux um, init. It mounts the file systems that are expected. Um, does some signal handling and other uh, administrative trivia that it init wants. Um, but you don't have to run it as init. If it's not running as init, it doesn't do all of this stuff. So um, in addition to that, I reorganized the sources so we could have ARM64, AMD64, whatever else, PowerPC, um, RISC-V. Um, and I enhanced the device support. Um, the Moto that I started with had uh, very basic support for just a device name. And you couldn't find the devices you have or list the devices or have them participate in ZFS at all. So um, it was kind of limited in what it could do. And we wanted to support booting off of ZFS. So I had to uh, implement a, a host device that could deal with all of that. I also um, wrote HostFS, which is modeled a little bit after um, user boots HostFS, but is tailored for the Linux environment. And it will go and let you read files off of the host um, if you want to read config files. Um, for the longest time, I was reading the kernel off of the host file so that I could uh, um, not have to write, you know, worry about writing this, the, the disk model. It parses the command line. It supports, um, I have a, here about 20, uh, 30 system calls later in the slide deck. I say it's 22 because I actually counted. Um, and right now, um, it works on ARM64. We're able to um, boot my um, my company's product and serve customers off of it in a laboratory environment. Um, AMD64 is maybe 80% done. AMD64 is AMD64 grew out of x86, which um, is our oldest booting uh, kernel, and so it has a long history and requires more extensive tweaks to get the boot environment just so. And I don't have all those done yet. Um, it compiles for PowerPC, but I don't have a good test setup for that. Um, so it doesn't um, uh, run in that environment. Or I haven't been able to test it. It still should work, but maybe it doesn't. Uh, one of the things I had to do to make this work was I had to build a Linux environment. And the last thing I wanted in our build world process was to reach out and install this Linux tool chain and that Linux tool chain and needing this dependency for that, all of this stuff. I wanted to keep it simple. So I wrote a simple C runtime environment, which for any binary you need to have. And all this does is when a binary is exec from the kernel, when it starts running, um, the kernel feeds it a lot of data and it does some initialization and then it eventually calls main um, with the RV that people are probably familiar with. That um, kernel, the um, early startup code and binary um, interface is different and different from system to system. So I wrote it at least for ARM, AMD64 and PowerPC. Um, I needed to do um, 
a system called wrappers. Read, write, open, and, and those sorts of things so that the uh, program can interact with it. Um, and then I needed to do a linker script because our normal default binaries weren't quite right. And once I had all these pieces um, in place, I was able to then start working on um, loader.kboot, which um, you know some of these I took bits and pieces from the, the previous one. Um, and I enhanced uh, what was there so that it would support everything we need. Um, one of the cool things is I can run this binary in the Linux emulator that, or the Linux implementation that we have on FreeBSD. All the way up to where it calls kexec, I can test. I can attach debuggers to and do that all on my FreeBSD box. I don't need anything special uh, to do that. Uh, one of the other things I implemented was Termios. The original uh, loader.kboot didn't set the terminal at all. It, it relied on, on somebody else to do that. And if you're running as a NIT or um, even just running as a binary, um, you have to put the terminal in raw mode so that the individual characters on the boot, menu boot or boot menus uh, work like you expect. You, you want to hit one, you don't want to hit one return because who does that? Who would even know to do that unless you're some weird mutant a uh, person who understands the low-level TTY driver stuff. Um, one of the things we want to do in our product is have some recovery over the internet or recovery over a private network. Um, the network configuration uh, portion of this is planned, um, but uh, hasn't been completed yet. Um, and so, Here's where I'll answer the one question that is um, currently in the Zoom chat. Um, the KXEC interface, actually, I think I'll answer it on the next slide. The KXEC interface um, basically is a very simple scattergather list. It says, um, I have these um, areas in physical memory, or sorry, these areas in the virtual address space of this process that I'm running in. Um, and they're this size, and I want you to load the contents of them to this location in physical memory. So that's one piece you get. You get to set up the memory the way you want it. Although building all of that in memory is a bit of a challenge. Um, fortunately, this is one of the areas of the bootloader that um, doesn't have a lot of technical debt. So it was fairly easy to adapt the mechanisms that it had to load it to malloc memory rather than to the actual physical memory it's going to eventually. Um, and then you also have a transfer address. Um, and this transfer address Basically, um, you for for this project, uh, we're going to transfer to a trampoline, and then the trampoline takes the difference between how Linux boots and the start environment that it expects, and how the FreeBSD kernel uh, what, what it expects. And for ARM, the differences are fairly small, and for AMD sixty four, the differences are larger. Um, so. Uh, Generally, um, the processor is in a minimal mode. Now, um, we were lucky on uh, AMD 64, it was already in long mode. So you didn't, I didn't have to climb um, the hill all the way from, it comes up in 16-bit mode and I have to go to 32-bit mode and from there into long mode, which our bootloader already does, but I didn't have to do any of that because that was all um, ready to go. The MMU is off uh, for AMD 64. Um, we have to boot with the MMU on so that the kernel can find where the bootloader is. Um, because with UAFI, we can't load it in a fixed location anymore because um, UAFI might be using some of the memory that we would normally load the kernel into. Um, and you know, the trampoline takes care of you know, setting all of this up on ARM64. There's some data we can't get to from our uh, program. So we copy that data in and then we jump to the kernel. Um, and it just jumps to the normal kernel entry point for the architecture that we find in the elf header for the kernel that we loaded. You know, just like normal way that things are booted. Um, so the, the, the thing I wanna say on this slide is, um, you know, apart from the examples I've given, AMD64 is particularly complex. There's a number of different things, like I said, that have co-evolved that, oh, the bootloader will do this and pass it to the kernel and the kernel expects it. and uh, the code that does it is right now buried deep down inside um, one or two uh, modules. It's not very uh, reusable. So I've had to dig that out pieces at a time, but we don't need all of it because we're not loading to physical memory directly. So there's some indirection. So it needs to be adopted a little bit. And so 
uh, one of the hangups in my committing this to um, FreeBSD is that I haven't yet uh, refactored all of this so that it's nice and reusable. Um, so one of the things that makes this also challenging is in Linux, it starts and it's the whole thing. The whole ballgame is it's where it starts. But in FreeBSD, um, we pass all the loadable modules, the tunables, um, different tables of memory locations, uh, DTB blobs, all of this gets passed in through the, the, the loader interface. So we have to get that all set up and working before we call the kernel entry point. Um, UEFI requires extra care normally because we have to preserve um, the sys table so we can call back to it at runtime, preserve the uh, memory tables and so forth. And in this environment, it's even worse because um, we don't know what the UEFI tables is. We have to get that from Linux before we jump into this environment. Um, and all of this handoff is not really documented anywhere. You look at the code, you'll find it by reading the code, not because there's nice comments in the code even necessarily. Some places are well commented and say, yeah, we load the kernel here. It's on a two meg boundary and we um, sniff through the um, TLB or the NMU tables to figure out where exactly it is in physical memory so we can kick off our initialization of PMAP with you know, the memory in the right place and all this other stuff. And the big hole maybe at the beginning of memory, um, we can you know, free that or have that not be marked as reserved when we, you know, so we can use that later in, in memory when we start uh, pboot. So, um, and this is an area, like I said, the bootloader is not super modular in this. There was a, the way we loaded and there was only one the way we loaded on any given platform. And now on x86, we've got um, several different ways to boot that go through the bootloader. Um, and so we have to make it a little bit more modular. Um, so on the Linux side, doing this in the Linux world, what were some of the things that um, I noticed and liked about it or didn't like about it? Well, um, the KXEC load system call, which is the basis for all of this, is very well documented. Um, you don't have to guess a number of things, um, but it assumes a start environment that's very similar to the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel leaves, um, you know, unwinds everything in it and leaves things around in a way that the um, subsequent kernels can use. And so there's a boot environment that it expects. And that's not very well documented. There's no certainly overview document of this. Certain aspects of it, certain details of it are well documented, but you have to know that you need those details in order to, to do that. And usually you don't find that you needed the detail until you are debugging a panic um, in FreeBSD. Um, so to do this project, I had to, to read the Linux kernel a lot, read the different um, KXEC tools and uroot, um, you know, and to find the information I should go looking for. Um, but, you know, finding it, part of what made it tricky is you needed to go see what these programs did. It's like, well, why are they doing that? And then, you know, work backwards. Oh, is there a documented interface for that? Or do I find this in the, only in the Linux kernel? Um, it's uh, tricky and involved. Um, each architecture, um, you know, took me a, a week or two, uh, maybe three to understand and implement. Um, each new one, is, if, after I get some of the refactoring done, might be a little bit easier, but it's still, um, it's not something you can uh, you know, knock out in an afternoon. Um, and also there's this EFI piece that um, you have to worry about. Um, you know, how do I get the, when Linux boot um, KXX, it leaves part of itself in memory to handle the UEFI runtime calls that the operating system needs to make. What time is it? Please reboot me, set these variables, although those that isn't usually supported. So, um, you know, it, the, the environment has some unique um, processes. And, you know, in some ways, a lot of people tell, oh yeah, it's simpler than UEFI. If you look at the different um, slide presentations on why you boot, um, but it is every bit as complicated as UEFI. Um, it does have the advantage of more eyes are looking at it, but you have a different, set of problems rather than no problems. All those eyes aren't perfect. The Linux kernel is still very big. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, the, the, the 
it's troublesome. And all of this stuff, the K exec to Linux, new Linux kernel handoff, um, just like our bootloader co-evolved with Linux. And some of people along the way documented it well, and some people didn't. And it's all these little fiddly bits that um, you know, make it a, a bit of a challenge to do. Um, the, the nice thing though, in a lot of ways, um, uh, from a reuse point of view in the bootloader, since it is a lot like UEFI, um, in the handoff has to be the same, we can reuse a lot of that code and the environment has to be the same. We can reuse a good part of that code, although some has to be rewritten. Um, so from that perspective, it's good. And if you're doing another UEFI-like um, architecture, uh, the, the process to do this um, is uh, simpler. Now, in the bootloader itself, um, the code, parts of the, like I said, parts of the code are very modular. Like if I'm reading the, the kernel in, that part's really modular. There's enough of function calls. I can replace those um, and it works great. Other parts of the system aren't so great. Um, we really haven't had a need to, for example, list all the disk devices. And so um, there's no way to do that. There's no way to list all the disk partitions. And so when you need to uh, support things like ZFS, you have to write a thing that looks at the list that your uh, module or model specific code created just for the purpose of walking through all the disks so that ZFS can find all the disks. We don't have a general mechanism to do that. It would be useful to have that. Also, um, there are bits of the code that assume that um, it uses a struct disk with partition table which is a reasonable assumption for all the other platforms that we have because we don't have any services to do that. But Linux provides the partition services and works better if you go through and use them rather than using the raw disk for everything. Um, and so you need to keep different information around when you have the lists of disks and partitions um, in the Linux world than you do in the um, you know, more traditional boot environments, but you still have a list and it still should be possible to iterate through the list to look for things or do things for each item in the list or for each item that it finds. And, and, and that's one of the areas that we could use some work on. Um, the other problem with the bootloaders, a lot of it was done with cut and paste. I have this bootloader that works. I have an environment that's kind of sort of similar. I'll copy all of that code. I'll delete the stuff I don't need. I'll add the stuff I do need. I'll leave the common stuff and I'll never refactor and I'll get on with my life. Um, and you know, the first couple of times you do that, it isn't a big deal, but you know, when you do it for um, user boot and then for UEFI and a little bit in U-boot, um, you, you wind up with a lot of duplicated code that you have to redo for your new platform or copy again for your new platform. Um, and that's you know, not really a good thing. Um, and one of the one of the problems with the bootloader today um, is that the scripting is a little weak. Um, it dates from a time when we had Forth as scripting, and not too many people knew Forth, so they leaned more, leaned more heavily on, "Oh, we'll just do it in, in straight code in C," rather than making these modular pieces that the scripts load uh, themselves. And so, um, if you want to do almost the same thing that we do today, except something a little different for your platform, that becomes kind of difficult. Now that we have Lua, we might want to um, look at making it more scriptable than it is today, because that would be useful um, in the environment I'm trying to deploy to, where I need to see if this exists or that exists, and you know, conditionally load this or that based on that, and set different parameters based on things I find in the, in the boot that isn't I wound up doing it in C code, but it doesn't seem like that's the right place to do that. Um, <clears throat> another problem is there are probably 80 ways to boot FreeBSD today. Um, 70 of them probably go through the bootloader. And, and, and testing all 70 of those is a challenge because we don't have scripts to um, create it all. I've created some scripting that does some things for x86, but um, you know, on ARM, there's nothing, and so we need uh, more. Um, we need we need some more stuff there. I've written a little bit as part of this project, but we need to look at you know how do we um, how do we flesh it out and make sure it's complete, and also how do we hook it into the user tests um, uh, ATF 
framework that we use for testing everything else because it's not hooked up into that. Um, and for the vast majority of the things you're booting, if you can boot the kernel and run a, uh, even a script that echoes hello world, um, the bootloader works. So we don't need to do a whole lot um, in terms of running FreeBSD, but you know, there's a number of different ways to do that, a number of QMU commands to do that, or Beehive commands or whatever, however we're going to, to, to manage that. And that makes it a little bit tricky. Um, and like I, like I alluded to, some things are well abstracted, like copy in and copy out is well abstracted, but the disk inter uh, the device interface isn't as well abstracted. So um, a lot of the code has to assume things that are a little bit dangerous in layering violations. Like the ZFS code assumes that we have a particular type of disk and you can use particular type of interfaces to get the list of partitions. And while that's what was there, it's probably not where it should be. Um, because we also have jelly code that um, needs to look for partitions as well. Um, and it hooks into a different part of the system at a different time and um, it does things differently, but it's basically the same thing. Which of these partitions that I have are jellies? What ones do I need to get keys for? When do I need to get the keys? All of this stuff um, is uh, uh, you know, kind of purpose-built for individual features rather than having a, a, a nice abstract framework um, behind the scenes. Um, and I just realized I forgot to answer the question of how do we communicate the handoff um, between the K exec and the um, kernel, whether it's NFS or whatever. Um, and it turns out we do that with the same way that we normally do. We pass in uh, a, um, a VFS mount root from that has that information that the kernel can use then to mount the root uh, file system. Sorry, I, I planned on doing that a few slides ago, but I'm to my end of the talk and it's time for questions. I heard a few dings on, um, IRC, but I have only seen the one question that um, was in um, uh, the Q&A for Zoom. So you guys probably know what my email address is. Um, so I don't need to uh, keep that up. So let me stop sharing and see if there are other questions that I can uh, read from IRC or if there are um, you know, other things that people would uh, <clears throat> like to um, to ask now. Um, I see that people are complaining about my complaining uh, on IRC. So, yeah, I won that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to frame it as, you know, this is these are things we can do to improve it to make it easier. Not that I think there necessarily will be additional boot environments. But every time we think, every time we've thought we're done in the past, there's a new one that comes along. So, you know, I think it would behoove, it would be good to catch up on some of the technical debt that we have. Um, so uh, I have a couple minutes, I see maybe seven minutes for additional questions that people might have. Um, but like I said, I'm not um, seeing them in Zoom. Uh, someone has a, you have a Zoom question actually. Um, someone's asked if it would make sense to re-implement dev match in the bootloader, which I, I will, we actually, at least in the x86 bootloader, we actually have some very vestigial things that never went anywhere that tries to enumerate PCI devices and old ESA plug and play to, with an eye towards that. But I'll let you answer the question. Um, right. So um, for x86, yeah, well, there's a bunch of vestigial stuff that aspirationally we're headed in that direction and never panned out. Um, I think it's a great idea. I, in fact, um, uh, Emmanuel Vadu, Manu, um, implemented this for FDT devices um, in the bootloader already. Um, it looks at the DTB and finds all the devices and loads the devices from the bootloader that it needs uh, so that uh, we can um, have a slimmed down kernel. Um, one of the destinations in mind was exactly that, but also with PCI and USB and everything else that we at least needed to boot to get to the point where we could do deathmatch. I think it makes good sense to still have the split between the bootloader and user land. And the reason for that is you want to start booting as quickly as possible in a lot of cases. And the more 
binaries that you load for random things you might happen to have plugged in uh, to your system, slows it down and introduces more points of failure to that. So I still think the split is good. And I would love to review patches um, that implemented this on you know, more of the x86, PCI, USB side, um, rather than just the FDT patches we have. ACPI might be another area that we could do this with. Then do you have a question from Ed Mast on IRC? Um, he's asked, do you see this support being used in use cases beyond what you're currently investigating? I mentioned one already, um, but yes, I do. Like the current use case I have is we have an interesting system that we want to boot on and um, we can run a Linux script and the Linux kernel there runs uh, is a, a Linux boot environment and everybody else that's integrating uh, boots Linux we're booting FreeBSD for our particular thing. And, um, sorry, that's the doorbell and annoying. Um, the other places I see it possibly useful for, um, I mentioned a, a little bit earlier the, in the cloud computing. If you have an image that's a Linux image, but you wanna run FreeBSD there and they haven't gotten around to doing anything with that, this could be a useful bootstrap for that environment or any, um, computers or uh, environments where you only have Linux and uh, maybe in like a low end embedded device where Linux boots, but you want to boot FreeBSD, well, you can boot Linux, run the loader.k uh, boot as part of um, the early boot there and run FreeBSD on that. Um, the other case that I have in mind um, that I'm doing a lot of is um, I also um, do uh, booting um, for testing on, um, <clears throat> what am I trying to say? Oh, testing in a uh, continuous integration environment. One of the things that um, I need to do is to, to, to Linux boot um, in, uh, to make sure the Linux boot is working with the scripts that I've written. But if we've got in CI, all we have is a Linux container, um, maybe uh, we can use this to, um, boot FreeBSD inside of that. Um, I know I'm hand waving a lot, but um, you know that might also be an area where it's a Linux only environment, but we could K exec FreeBSD to do the final stage of testing or, or, or something. So there's potential there. I've not investigated all the places we could use this, but if it's running Linux now, potentially we could use it to run FreeBSD or to develop a kernel for FreeBSD or for early boot, uh, bring up on a new system might also be useful. So those are the areas that um, beyond just, hey, I'd like to k-boot, you know, I'd like, I have an environment where the only way to run FreeBSD is to do this. Um, and I'd like to integrate into that environment or ecosystem. Um, you know, there's other things that um, fit that fairly well that we could use it for, so. Yeah, the CI one, I was actually going to follow up and ask, but you already answered it. Because that's <clears throat> the one I had thought of too, is our, our problem of needing to build an OS image that we want to run inside of a CI. <laughs> we don't want to get the CI. So that, that would be an interesting trick. Yeah, and um, if we could build an image inside of Linux and then k-exec it at the end, yep. that might also be interesting as well, rather than doing the nested virtualization we might have to do. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. You would so, have to, I guess it'd be like a RAM desk or something that you would build, but you could make it work. Exactly. And that way, you know, it's completely ephemeral and you could do that. Um, you know, it might even be interesting to have a, um, have this on our installer um, so that, uh, you know, people that have a Linux system could, you know, run a Linux command, uh, you know, mount the CD, CD, you know, the CD yep. image, but, you know, they could mount the CD and, you know, run, um, you know, loader.kboot and it boots the FreeBSD installer and you could install from there. That might also be an interesting um, way we could integrate this further once it's more widely deployed. And that last 20% that's going to take me a way too long on AMD64 is taken care of. So the other thing I like about this um, is uh, since I'm running it in QEMU, I can use it to um, attach uh, GDB directly to QAMU rather than having to go through a serial port to debug the kernel. Oh yeah. But, but you don't need Linux boot for that, but it's been a very useful thing when I'm debugging Linux boot. The other thing, um, I have two modes that I tested on. Um, one is um, 
booting the Linux boot kernel directly or Linux kernel directly um, in QAMU where there's no BIOS even. Um, and that works fairly well and we can run, um, <clears throat> but you don't get any UAFI or anything. And um, one of the areas of integration in that boot, I don't pass the memory map in correctly today. So FreeBSD takes a memory map and assumes it's good because it has to, and then bad things happen. It's one of the problems I need to look at for AMD 64. So. Yeah, one of the thoughts I had is um, right now in other architectures, the kernel is at least somewhat relocatable. For example, ARM64 and low core, we just assume that we have some kind of mapping where virtual addresses equal physical addresses and we can kind of cope and, and figure out where we are and kind of cope. Um, risk five right. is the same way. Whereas x86, like kernel load is a constant that gets compiled in. And I, I don't, I wonder, having a little more experience now mm -hmm. myself with our other architectures, how hard it would be to at least fix that part of our kernel so that we could learn what physical address we're at and cope with it. That would that would eliminate the need actually, for aging hack and so forth. Right, right. So right now we link to a particular address yep. and we um, assume that we're going to run that in a virtual environment. And um, one of the things that um, Constantine has done recently is basically kind of what you suggest. He looks at the um, uh, MMU tables to find out what the physical address of the underlying pages are to find out where we're loaded. And you have to load at a two meg offset, just like on ARM. It's a little less flexible and a little less obvious that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of, um, I didn't do things with an eye, like you're saying, to having a relocatable kernel that we could get rid of some of the gross and ugly kludges that we have so we can load modules. I mean, that is an area that we could look at independent of this work, but kind of you know related to it in the same area. Okay, well, it's 1030. Um, well, it's in my time zone. Different people's time zones are different, but it is the end of the slot. I'm gonna check to see if there are any last minute questions. I don't see any, um, but maybe we can talk more about relocatable kernels over in the hallway track if you have time. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you very much, Warner. Oh, you bet. I'll jump into the hallway track if I can find it in my email and we can chat there. All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Good. You've been a lovely audience. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Warner. Uh, so we are going to uh, take our next break and we'll be back in about 30 minutes for a talk um, from folks at Microsoft on using FreeBSD on Hyper-V, but for, but for ARM64 rather than x86. So we'll see you all back here in about a half hour. Thank you.